Hi everybody, this is the chapter three lecture video. I'm not going to be reading the PowerPoint verbatim. I believe that all of you guys can do that, but I am going to be using the PowerPoint um, to hit some of the highlights on what I feel is very important. Um, if there's any questions at the end, please, 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 don't hesitate to give me a call or um, send me an email. I would love to chat with any of you about any of this material. So jumping in. Let me get my screen, my screen shared. All right, so the self, social, and moral development chapter three. Some of the key, key theorists that we're going to spend some time talking about today is Broffenbrenner, Erickson, Kohlberg, and Haidt. Um, when it comes to physical development, we talk about gross motor skills. Those are big motor skills, the big muscles that students are doing. Fine motor are small coordinations um, that take really small movements. Um, when we talk about hand preference, being right-handed or being left-handed, I did that backwards, being right-handed or being left-handed, <coughs> we can usually tell which hand is going to be the dominant hand by age five. Please don't try to change the handedness. Um, just help them learn to use whatever one that they are using. In elementary, we're going to see a steady physical development. There's a lot of variation. Um, we do see that girls develop earlier than boys. Um, girls reach their final height by 15, 16, and boys will reach their final height around 19. When it comes to play, recess, and physical activity, play is so super, super important. Um, there's even the quote, play is children's work. This is essential to their cognitive, social, emotional, and physical development. Um, unfortunately, what we're seeing is exercise and recess are being reduced in schools um, way too often. And this is happening to allow for more academic time because of the state of the standardized testing that we have today. And we know how important exercise and recess and physical activity is for all students, especially those that have ADHD. So some challenges in physical development, we are seeing a growing trend of obesity. This comes down to poor diet, genetics, and just a general lack of activity. And we're seeing an increase in eating disorders. There are two main types of eating disorders. We have bulimia and anorexia nervosa. Bulimia is when we binge eat, we overeat, we overindulge, and then we purge it in somehow. That could be purging by throwing up or that could be purging by um, taking a laxative to have it go um, out the other way or we can see excessive exercise. Anorexia nervosa is self-starvation where they become very, very strict in their calorie count and what they allow themselves to eat. If you have any concerns about a student with an eating disorder, it is going to require professional help. The DSM actually states that eating disorders, anorexia um, prevalently, is the most deadly mental health disorder in the entire DSM. So it's a really dangerous uh, development that students can have. We see it a lot in middle school and high school as we start to see a change in our physical development um, and some of that comparing between themselves and peers. Um, for your test, you're really going to want to know these guidelines for supporting positive body images. Even if you're working, if you're in elementary, um, teacher or you're planning on being an elementary teacher, you need to know these because our students are starting to have these concerns earlier and earlier. And if you're thinking this is mostly girls, that's not correct anymore. Um, we are seeing a growing trend of boys struggling with eating disorders also. Somebody is listed here, uh, this utilize your counselor. If you have a concern, 
go talk to them. They can help you reach out to the parents and um, find that professional help that these students need. So moving on, Bravin Brenner, he came up with the ecological, bioecological model. And this is a system of interlocking rings that they, he said that the individual is in the center and every system is on the outside around them. The closer the system is to the individual, the more influence it has on them. So you can see the microsystem is their family, their school, their peers. Those are the people they have daily contact with. The next circle is the mesosystem. Then we have the exosystem and then the macro system. And that macro system is like the parents' jobs. This is the society as a whole. But the closer the circle is to the individual, the more influence it has. So you can see here the microsystem, family, friends, teachers. The meso is um, interactions among the microsystem. So this is the parents interacting with the school or the, um, that's usually the biggest one. The exosystem, these are social settings that can affect the child. These are the relationship their teacher has with admin. So let's say the teacher has a bad interaction with the admin, comes into the classrooms a little bit more grumpy and that affects the student. So that's how that exosystem is affecting the individual. Macro systems, a larger society um, that I mentioned. So how our laws affect parents, how it affects their children. So what we see here with these arrows that I want you to notice is the influences go in and out. What influences the individual, the individual can also influence the outer, outer systems. And you will need to have a good understanding of at least know those systems in examples of what's inside of each one of those. Many of you have probably heard of parenting styles before. We have four different styles. We have authoritative, authoritarian, permissive, and rejecting. Um, I wish I would have put this on here and I'll probably add it to the module. When we think of authoritative, this is a high warmth, high control. They love their children. Clear limits are set. Um, these children are likely to do well. The children have high, the parents have high expectations for the children but they also really know that they're loved. Authoritarian is when there's low warmth, but high control. They do love their kids, but maybe the kids don't see it. These are our parents who don't say, I love you. They don't give hugs, but they're maybe showing their love in other ways. But there are also a lot of, um, do this because I said so. You know, I am the end all be all, this is how it is. So that very authoritarian type of mentality. Children are more likely to feel guilty or depressed living in these kinds of situations with these relationships because they're oftentimes feeling like they're wrong or they don't have a whole lot of autonomy. Permissive parents have high warmth but low control. So these are the ones who let their kids do just about whatever they want. There's few rules and consequences, but they also have low behavior expectations. Children with permissive parents oftentimes have a hard time interacting with peers because they're very used to getting their way. And when we, what we know about students is um, that they have to give a little in those interactions. It can't always be one child's way. And the last one is rejecting, neglecting, or uninvolved. These are low warmth and low control. Um, these are the parents that come across as they just don't care. Um, they're not communicating. They're not teaching. So take some time to look at page 83 so that you have a good understanding about culture and parenting. Um, this is where it's important that we don't jump to conclusions or we don't use stereotypes um, to say all individuals of this ethnicity have this type of parenting strategy or um, that it's a negative thing uh, just because it looks a little bit different than what it looks like for us. So there are four categories of popularity. We have popular, rejected, controversial, and neglected. In the popular, we have the pro-social. Um, these are the ones who are really easy to get along with. They're really caring, they're really nice. Um, so it makes sense why they're popular. Then we have the antisocial ones. These are often our, um, 
they're very aggressive. They might bully their way where people use or where people are afraid of them. And so they might use intimidation for their popularity. Inside the rejected form, we have aggressive and withdrawn. So if they are aggressive, that means they um, have a lot of con conflict and hyperactivity, a lot of impulsivity. And withdrawn is maybe they're just socially awkward, and these are often um, targeted for bullying. Controversial students, they have both positive and negative social qualities. They have friends, but they might be hostile. Or they could be pro-social. Sometimes people just aren't really sure which, um, which friend they're going to get that day. And then we have our neglected. They're well-adjusted. They're socially competent. They're shy, but they usually seem like they're pretty happy. Our withdrawn students aren't happy with how things are going for them. Um, these other ones, these neglected, tend to be a little bit more happy. Some forms of aggression and why these are important. Um, aggression can come in three different ways. It can be instrumental, it can be hostile, or it can be cyber. Aggressors usually use aggression to get what they want. They a lot of times will assume the other child intended to harm them. This is the student that somebody bumps into them and instead of saying, oh, that was an accident, the hallway's crowded, they'll say things like, they did it on purpose. Um, they were totally trying to bump into me. They wanted me to drop uh, whatever was in my hand. So they uh, assign an intention. Why we need to know how to deal with aggression is that um, we need to make sure we have plans in place in our classroom and in our classroom management skills so that we can handle aggression. Um, you know, an example would be we have a student who becomes very overtly hostile. He's threatening a physical attack on somebody else. How are you going to manage that as a classroom teacher? Um, rule number one, always get the students, all the rest of the students out of the classroom if you're worried about anybody's safety. Um, so just go back and read cha that chart on page 91, so guidelines for dealing with that. And the text does talk about three, um, three different, I don't know, models or influences on aggression, television, video games, music, social media, um, you're going to see this come up on the final, so you might just make a mental note of talking or flag it in your text about what influences aggression. Again, television, video games, music, and social media. So child abuse, you need to understand what it means to be a mandated reporter. In the state of Kansas, as an educator, you are a mandated reporter. What that means is you are mandated you have an obligation, a legal obligation, to report any suspicion of child abuse. In the text, it says that it's the teacher's responsibility to report suspected abuse to the principal, school psychologist, counselor, or social worker. In the state of Kansas, if you suspect abuse, you must be the one to report it. You can't go tell your principal and expect them to report it. You have to report it. Uh, my greatest hope is that you will have a good school counselor in your building and that person will be able to support you and help walk you through that process. If you don't have a school counselor, keep my email, uh, call me, email me. I will be more than happy to help you with that process as I was a school counselor um, before I moved back to, to Kansas to pursue my PhD. So there, if you Google Kansas Department for Children and Families Child Abuse, it'll bring up a guide. It's very similar to the chart that's on page 94 um, that walks you through what you might see for physical abuse, for emotional abuse, for sexual abuse. It's very, very handy. I would encourage you to print it off, put it in the three ring binder or folder and keep it handy um, because as teachers you're it's going to come up you're going to see things or children are going to say things 
and you're going to need to listen to your instincts and make a report. So understand what it means for you as a mandated reporter. Uh, a few indicators, the physical ones, these are ones that everybody already knows. Um, lots of bruises, cuts, unexplained injuries, frequent unexplained injuries. Um, or if they start telling you that this injury is caused by something that doesn't make sense to you, or you can, they're not looking at you when they're talking to you about it. Um, just all of those. Neglect is a little bit harder to determine. You're gonna have to really listen, um, but it could be where they talk about unintended uh, medical needs. For instance, I had a student who was in the foster system and when he got upset, he would punch a wall and his foster family refused to take him to the emergency room um, and have his dislocated knuckles dealt with because they were upset that he would continually punch these walls. So that was an unattended medical need that we did have to report on so that he could get the help that he needed. Um, sexual abuse here, difficulty walking or sitting if they a young child talks to you about it hurts um, in their genitals or if they're picking at the area, if a there's a pregnancy, some chronic depression, or even um, extreme promiscuity for a really young age. Those can all be indicators of potential sexual abuse. Again, I encourage you to go talk with your counselor or social worker or school psychologist. They can help you um, determine what needs to be done and then hopefully they'll support you through that process. All right, many of you have probably heard of Eric Erickson and his eight stages of psychosocial development. There is a chart on page 97 that does a good job of walking through these eight stages. You can see here the three that are highlighted are the three that tend to deal with school, um, school age children the most. Um, you do need to know all eight of them. When we talk about Eric Erickson and his stages, we say trust versus mistrust. And we talk about there is like this crisis that students have to overcome. When we're talking about trust, this is birth to 12 to 18 months so that very first year. And this is where the young infant learns that they're going to be cared for. So they learn to trust. And if that care and that warmth is not there, then they learn mistrust. And so that is kind of that crisis. Um, autonomy is that independence. I can do these things where we, they learn that they can um, do things on their own. This is where parents have a hard time, but it's taking a step back and letting them do things on their own. Initiative is where they take those steps. They set a goal or they set a plan and then they get started. If they're not doing that, then um, guilt might set in. This also happens when we don't let them do things on their own. Um, what it, Adults need to provide supervision without interference, just letting them learn for themselves. Industry versus inferiority, this starts about age six and goes to age 12. Industry is where we have our perseverance and we feel success in tasks, where we say, I can do this, I've done this, I feel successful. The text talks about how um, in industry, are students who come from more disadvantaged economic statuses or um, different situations, they have a harder time with this industry because they're already having to overcome so many struggles before they walk into the school setting. Um, so as teachers, this is where using that chart on page 98, encouraging initiative in industry can be really helpful so that we can help students overcome some of those disadvantages so they can feel that success. And then in adolescence, this is where we're starting to form our identity, that, that concept of who am I. This is where the individual organizes their drives, abilities, beliefs, and history into one image of themselves, where they make these choices and say, this is who I am. If they're unable to make those choices, they might be confronted with world confusion. 
So then you can see that there's three more stages through young adulthood, middle adulthood, and late adulthood. So read through those. You're gonna need to know those three that are highlighted the most because that's what we're going to see in schools the most. So searching for identity, when we're talking about who am I, there's two processes that we go through when we're achieving our identity. Exploration is when we're trying out different, different identities, where we're trying different groups of friends, we're trying different thought patterns, we're trying different beliefs, and we're just trying to, we're kind of trying it on. We're saying, does this fit with how I view myself? And once we've done exploration, then we make it a commitment where we choose our belief, where we say, this is who I am. There's four different categories of identity statuses. This is where James uh, Marsha added to this. Those are identity achievement. This is after we've explored, we've made our choices, we commit to pursuing them. It's not uncommon for this to continue until our early 20s. Um, this is where I've actually gotten up. I have a, I don't know a soapbox where it doesn't make sense to me that we ask 18 year olds to choose the college major because it doesn't make sense that at 18 I'm going to choose what I want to do for the rest of my life. It is okay to explore different options. Um, in moratorium, this is where the individual is exploring but we're struggling and we might suspend making a choice where we're choosing not to choose because of this struggle. This is also very common. In identity foreclosure, um, this is where our parents' choices or their thoughts, their beliefs, we take on ourselves without any exploration. These are often rigid, intolerant, and defensive. It's just this is what I'm choosing because this is how my parents are. And identity diffusion, this is being confused about who you are and what you want, or we just go along with the crowd. Um, unfortunately, these individuals are more likely to do drugs and fall to peer pressure because they don't have a foundation for who they see themselves um, as. This is another good opportunity to utilize your school counselor for career, um, have them come in and help work with your students. So when we're talking about it, developing a self-concept and self-esteem, these are two different, um, two different concepts. Self-esteem is the value that I feel about who I am as a person. My self-concept is who do I see myself as a person? Um, so self-concept would be I am somebody who does what I say more often than not. I really try to make my word mean something. I try to be consistent. Self-esteem would be how do I feel that I have value as a person? You know, I feel like I have a moderate self-esteem because I'm – it's my overall judgment of my self-worth. Um, there's been a big push about self-esteem throughout, I don't know, the last decade, maybe two in schools. And now there's a debate as has there been too much of a focus on that self-esteem. So self-concept also evolves through constant self-evaluation. You know, see here, young children are often positive, optimistic about their self-concepts, and older children are less optimistic, but they're more realistic. We talk about the theory of mind and intention. This is where we understand that other people have their own minds, thoughts, feelings, and beliefs. By age two, children know that they have their own intention and they're later able to recognize other people's intentions. Um, this is where we talked about uh, some students who struggle with aggression have a harder time with understanding people's intentions and will misassign intentions um, to people. When we're developing our theory in mind, we need to have an understanding that others have different feelings and experiences than ourselves. This is very important to moral development, that not everybody is exactly like us. Not everybody has gone through the same things that we have gone through. Lawrence Kohlberg came up with a theory of moral development. He came up with six stages, um, pre-conventional to post-conventional. You can see they're numbered there, one through six. 
and this kind of follows along with our ages. So we start with, um, in our pre-conventional, our judgment's based on our own needs. We obey rules to avoid punishment. And then we have our awards and exchanges. Our personal needs determine what's right and wrong. After we, as we grow, we move into the conventional stage. This is where we take account into laws and expectations in the relationship. We do um, what's right to please others, or we do what's right because we believe in the law and we want to follow the law or maintain our social system. Not as many people move into the post-conventional stage where we have our abstract judgments. Um, the social contract is that the greatest good for the greatest number in the um, universal ethical principle. I do believe the text talks about that many people don't reach this number six. Uh, I hope everybody read page 109 with the criticisms of his theory. He only studied Western uh, white males when it came to this. And so that's one of the criticisms is that it doesn't take into account other ethnicities and other genders. Um, I guess this would be a good time to talk about Carol Gilligan. Um, she came up with a moral development system that was more centered around women and care and welfare. So make sure you read about her. She called it an ethic of care that we move from a focus on self-interest into the highest level of morality based on responsibility and care for all people. The text also says that research says that moral reasoning is more strongly influenced by context and content than by gender of the reasoner. So I also like that it talks about that we use care when we're talking about interpersonal issues and we use justice when we're talking about societal dilemmas. So we use care and justice when we're making our decisions. And it's not necessarily a hierarchy like Lawrence Kohlberg suggested. The moral domain, the, one of the things that we see the most often in classrooms is distributive justice. This is the idea that it needs to all be equal. So this is the belief about how to divide materials or privileges fairly among groups. Um, so make sure you understand that concept. So Haidt came up with the social intuitives model of moral psychology. Um, he said that moral choices involve more than just reasoning. He has three key principles. Intuition comes first and reasoning comes second. That means we instantly, when we have a, a problem, we right away have an idea of how to handle it. Our intuition comes first and then we create reasoning around that. He also said that there is more to morality than just fairness and harm. He found that these were these moral foundations. You need to know these. So make sure that you go through and understand loyalty and betrayal, authority, subversion, sanctity, and degradation, liberty, and oppression. Sorry, I'm struggling with my words all of a sudden. And he also talked about morality binds and blinds, but make sure you understand his moral foundations. And as a teacher, we need to make sure we have an understanding between moral behavior and cheating. There's three influences on moral behavior, and these kind of go in an order also. Modeling. Children are exposed to the models of moral behavior. This is what they see their parents doing. They see their teachers doing it. Internalizing is where they adopt it as their own. This is what I'm going to do. And then self-concepts is this is who I am as a person. So for example, they might see their parents telling the truth even though it's difficult. They might, then they internalize it that I should tell the truth. And then self-concept is I am an honest person. Cheating on academic work is based on decisions. Um, this is when there is a really high stakes, when we are only focused on performance goals, or they feel low self-efficacy for a task, or they feel that they're not going to get caught. 
best ways to prevent cheating in the classroom is avoid high pressure situations, focus more on the learning than the outcome, and uh, prepare them for the assessments. Have a growth mindset, make it okay to make mistakes, remove some of those other pressures. So that is the end of chapter three. If anybody has any questions, comments, again, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, there's a lot of information in chapter three, so I really encourage you to uh, read it early in the week, participate in the discussion board, uh, do your application exercises. You have time and do your licensure exam before the, uh, the chapter exam that you have to come to campus for. Those are all strategies. Use those self-checks that I mentioned in the e-text. Um, yeah, you guys are rocking and rolling, so let me know if you need anything.